This morning we have um, our guest is Misty Page Tran, uh, and she's a Southern California native, one of the few, and holds a PhD in biology from the University of Washington. Her research on animal performance translates into bio-inspired designs, such as non-clogging, high-efficiency filters based on manta ray gills, and nearly impenetr impenetrable armor inspired by tiny fishes in the Amazon that can withstand piranha bites. So please welcome Misty, Dr. Misty P. <laughs> May I also say that um, we'd also like to welcome her parents who are here in the audience. So they're back there and they may not want to raise their hands but, and remain anonymous. But they're here to hear her, her lecture. All right, thank you, Misty. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for coming out today. I appreciate that. Um, I'm pretty excited, actually, to talk about this because I've just started reorganizing my lab. And instead of giving you one lecture, I've decided to give you basically three lectures um, because my lab has such disparate topics. And we're all sort of bound by this topic of biomechanics. So uh, to start. My research primarily uh, is focused on very large animals, although we are starting to get into very, very small animals. So I'm gonna give you a very large size scale today. And I sort of live my life and my lab operates under this idea that if we sort of sit and we watch nature, we can almost always find a better solution for our human problems than we could do just by simply trying to design something off the top of our heads. So, uh, to give you an idea of what my lab does, we are a biomechanics lab which focuses on uh, bioinspiration. So, some of the bioinspiration, this isn't a new topic. Um, there are lots of bioinspired designs all over the world. Some of them um, you may already have known about. So, for example, up here on the left hand side, you can see that there's a bioinspired robot based on elephant trunks. So, elephant trunks. Um, work without bones. They're a hydrodynamic skeleton. And so we're able to create these new soft robots based on what elephants use um, with their anatomy to, uh, well, here to, to get an apple. But really what we're using it for is for deep sea exploration. So if you bring a submersible down to the deep sea, it has crushing pressure. And so uh, for example, you may have seen videos before of cans being taken down to the deep sea and basically being squashed to bits. But soft robots, because there are no hard elements, are actually able to stand up to the pressures of the deep sea, which is pretty neat. Uh, over on this side, you can see that there are actually architectural buildings now that are being designed based on the um, really light skeletal mechanics of birds, so lots of holy skeletons. And these, these new buildings are actually able to withstand earthquakes and other um, uh, large scale sort of geological events while still being very light in construction. So I tend to go towards the bio uh, inspired design based on um, terrestrial animals. So here is a gecko foot under uh, electron microscopy. And what you can see here are all these tiny little hairs. And those tiny little hairs on the gecko feet are actually what allows the gecko to climb straight up a wall. So we can use that, uh, that design to then create things for humans. For example, this is a grad student over at Stanford. And he's basically scaling up uh, a glass wall so they only let him go up about two stories before they stopped him. But he was able to do that with ease. And that's all based on this nanostructure of the gecko foot. So for me, um, that's less exciting for climbing really slick surfaces, because I don't really climb. But um, what I think about is, uh, how does this improve my life? And so I started thinking about shower caddies. And this uh, shower caddies almost always fail, right? They're up on the wall for a little bit of time, and then they pop off and everything comes off. And so I started thinking, wouldn't this be great if we can design a better shower caddy? I wasn't alone in thinking about that. So um, where I did my PhD was at University of Washington. And my advisor, who was also the scientist behind Finding Nemo, 
Um, he's also interested in these sticky surfaces, only instead of geckos, he's interested in uh, fishes, in particular these little clean fish that are intertidal fishes that can basically stick on rocks and not be uh, taken off rocks even under the highest of wave action forces. So, uh oh. So I can't show you any video. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, are we back? We're back. So just to show you what this looks like, here is the cling fish. Here's a little cling fish. That one's dead. It's not alive anymore. And so what they did is they stuck it to the rock and they let this cling fish, a dead cling fish, pick up the rock. And they found that at least the northern cling fish, this is a cling fish that lives in Washington, and actually we have it off our coast as well, was able to lift about 80 times its body weight. But the cling fish in Australia, we're able to lift about 1,300 times its body weight. So I'll try to show you this video here. That's a dead clingfish. And there it goes. Pretty cool. So he did it. And he actually patented this um, bio-inspiration. And he's now created with his postdoc, Petra, um, a new design for a suction cup, just like I asked him to do. I'm going to take credit for all of his successes. And oh, and this is actually lifting about um, 1,500 times the body weight of that, that suction. Uh, and it not only works on rough surfaces, but also on slick surfaces. So this is what he's thinking is going to be the new application for climbers, et cetera, coming out. So this paper actually just came out this month. For me, um, my trajectory is I was a happy, trained marine biologist. Um, I went to school at Cal State Long Beach for my undergrad, and I thought that I was going to basically do conservation on animals until I actually went up to the lab at Friday Harbor up in Washington, um, where I met my advisor, and I basically joined the dark side. So I moved from conservation of fishes, which I feel is extremely important, and I was really excited to do that, and then I was introduced to bio-inspiration, and I said, why not? So um, part of the reason is I was told, at going from an undergrad to a PhD, that I'd be allowed to work with whale sharks and manta rays. And of course, a new undergraduate is going to say yes to that. So I started my work on manta rays. I also got to um, use new visualization techniques and clearing and staining techniques. And that's me with the head of um, about an 800-pound shark that happened to wash up when I was doing my PhD. So I got to do lots of anatomy. So I told you a little bit earlier that I'm a biomechanist. And probably for most of you, that's a little bit of a foreign term. It was for me when I started this path. So just to define it a little bit for you, basically a biomechanist is an anatomist. I spent the um, initial part of my PhD actually in um, med school over at UCI before we moved to Washington. Um, and so learning human gross anatomy and really understanding humans because we know the most about humans. So if we understand um, a human, we can basically apply that to anything with a backbone. And then I combine that with engineering and physics techniques, which I used to tell my older sister that physics doesn't apply to me, and now it unfortunately applies to me every day. And I mix those two disciplines in order to, um, to work on form and function, so describing how animals do what they do, so animal performance. For example, this is a fish. It used to be the fish with the longest protruding jaw. So here it is, Epibullus. We just came out with a paper about two weeks ago that beat that fish, so that's nothing anymore. All right, so I did tell you that I was going to give you a three-part series for my work, so I'm going to focus on the first, well, and four. I have one slide on the fourth one. Um, the first four projects that are happening in my lab, but actually this is not a comprehensive list of what's happening in my lab at the moment, so you can see that we're very, very different in all of our projects. We go from uh, very large fishes and looking at filtration all the way to things like microplastics. So actually my postdoc is here um, in the audience today and she's been um, heading up my projects on the effects of microplastics in our urban oceans. So very, very different topics. And of course, I have to give a shout out to my grad students and my undergrads before I continue any further, because these are really the people who do the hardcore lifting in my lab. Um, I'm sort of always stuck 
writing grants, and then I can pop in and do some research a little bit. But these are, these are the students that are really um, taking charge of these projects. So my first three projects are taken out, or were completed by my grad students. So this is Raj, this is Andrew 1.0, this is Andrew 2.0. <laughs> And then these are my current grad students down here, my postdoc Sam who's in the audience, and these are some of my undergrads that are currently in the laboratory. Oop. Okay, so I promised you some big news here. Um, my initial interest or my, my main interest is in filtration. So when I started my PhD, I started asking questions about how whale sharks and manta rays, which a whale shark in general is about um, the length of, oh, I would say from me to the back of the room. Um, manta rays about the, the wingspan of this um, area here, the width of the room. So very, very large animals who eat some of the smallest organisms on the planet, plankton, so much smaller than a pencil eraser. And when I was transitioning into grad school, I really thought, well, how do they do that? And I wasn't really satisfied with the answers. Um, for some of you, you may not be familiar with the mantas and the whale sharks, but here are a couple other types of filter feeders on the planet. So probably you know that most baleen whales are filter feeders, so blue whales, etc. Maybe some of you didn't know that flamingos actually filter feed. I didn't know that before I started working on this. Tadpoles, before they transition to frogs, are filter feeders. There are lots of different types of fishes that filter feed. And I primarily um, study the very large sharks and rays. So here's a whale shark. This is mega mouth shark, a dead one, unfortunately. This is one of the rare sharks on the planet, and the mobulas and mantas. All right, so when I first started this project, I was watching manta rays, videos of manta rays, and I actually went out to the field and started observing manta rays. And I noticed that when they're filtering, so you can see all these little black things are the plankton that they're eating, and the ray is swimming through, usually doing barrel um, loops, scooping up that plankton. What I noticed is that they feed by opening their mouth and continuously feeding without usually swallowing. They swallow about every 10 minutes. And so the big question I had was, well, how does this filter not clog? So all of the literature up to the point that I started this said that they were sieve filter feeders. So sieve filter feeding is basically what you do with pasta. So you boil your pasta, you strain it through a colander, anything that's larger than that pore size is gonna stay, anything that's smaller than that pore size is gonna exit out with the water. And this is what every piece of literature up to this point had said this is how manta rays filter this is how whale sharks filter all of the big things even whales this is what is still currently believed how whales filter i don't think so but i haven't studied that yet so my question to you is do you think that's what's happening i mean they're such small plankton and such big animals it just really didn't make sense to me but the first thing I needed to do was look at the anatomy to see if these two sizes matched up. There were some other types of filtration that were known in fishes. So here's that sieve filtering there, particle that's too big to get through the filter and the water leaves. You might have a hydrosol filter, which basically means that you have something sticky on the filter. And so if the particle hits that, it'll get trapped in that, that sticky stuff. Usually it's mucus and it stays. Uh, in about 2001, we discovered a new type of filtration in fishes ca called cross-flow filtration, where particles actually move across the filter, the filters down below, and um, through tangential shearing, which just means it's pushed back, um, these things ex or move back towards the esophagus and the water will turn and exit out the pores. This is a pretty important form of filtration, so it's not the first time we've seen it in the world because beer and wine is made through cross-flow filtration, but it was the first time we saw it in an animal. And then there's cyclonic filtration, which is basically how your Dyson vacuum cleaner works, where uh, dirty air will come into a cyclone and then it'll spin down smaller and smaller. As it gets smaller and smaller, the particles fling out to the side and you eventually end up with clean air. So these were some of the theories I thought might be happening with manta rays and whale sharks. 
When I started looking at pictures inside of the mouth, I noticed that these tiny little plankton particles were much smaller than the filters. So these are the gill arches of the animal. You can barely see it in there, but there's some filters in there. These particles were about a third of the size of the holes. So sieving to me was obvious that that's not what was happening. My next step was to go out and film it. So I don't know how many of you have been out and tried to film anything in nature while it's happening, but I thought that I was so cool going out and swimming with a whale shark. So this is a whale shark here. It's moving. You notice that I'm madly swimming in front of it. It hits me. I'm trying to shove a camera in its mouth. Yes, I had permits to do that. And see what's happening inside the mouth, and it was just impossible. This happened over and over and over again. I couldn't get the shot. I had no idea what was going on, and I started to become frustrated. So in the same plankton bloom were the mantas. And I thought, OK, mantas are going to work here. And the manta basically saw me, shut its mouth, and swam away. Mantas are some of the smartest animals in the sea. They have a large brain to body ratio, and they really don't like me trying to, to put a camera in its mouth. So it basically booked it. I'm swimming as fast as I possibly could. For about six months before I went out, I was training swimming so I could swim as fast as it, and I still wasn't able to get the shot. So basically, I figured my research was done. I wasn't going to be able to answer these questions. Um, and then I started rethinking this. I thought, well, you know what? We have a few, not very many, but a few of these things in museums. So why not look to museum specimens first and see what I can see? All right. So when I was out in the field, the one good thing I was able to get was a speed of how fast these things were swimming, because they were swimming really fast, but while they were feeding. And what I noticed is, in the same plankton patch, the mantas and the whale sharks actually swam at very different speeds. So this at about a half a meter per second, and this one at about 1.1 meter per second. So this was basically double the speed. And I started to, um, to look at some of the literature of what they've found inside of the guts of these things. And I found that the manta rays were known to eat things like sargassids, which would be somewhere in this 101 to 1,000 micron size range, and whale sharks at about zero, uh, or sorry, at about 50 to 101 microns. So they're in the same plankton, and yet they're feeding on completely different things. If these are sieve filters, they should have indiscriminate sizes. Anything that's larger than the pore size should stay. So when I started looking in the museum specimens and looking at the anatomy of these things, so this is a histological preparation. Basically what I've done is I've taken some of the filter out, I've cut it down, and I've stained it so that it's really pretty, and I looked at the filter. So this is what the filters would look like normally. This is kind of what it looks like in cartoon version when it's stained. All of this right here is epithelial tissue. That's basically skin tissue on the filter. And when I look really closely here, I see that there are nice mucus cells within there. So here you can see it in kind of this blue color, all those mucosal cells. And I said, great. I know exactly how these things filter. They're using a sticky substance to filter. Fabulous. I've answered the question. They're not sieve filters. They're sticky sieve filters. What's the one thing you never want to do once you have an answer is keep testing, right? So I started looking across the board at all these different manta rays in museums, and I found that only three actually had this mucus. Two I wasn't sure about because they just weren't in museums anywhere. The rest of these, including the whale shark and the mega mouth, which I actually have in my lab now, and the basking shark, and then the rest of the rays didn't have any traces of mucus cells in there. So. Never keep asking questions, right? Right? Quit while you're ahead. That's a good way to go about it. I would have been fine that way, but I didn't. So now I had to figure out what was happening. 
And I knew I couldn't put my hand back into one of their mouths because they weren't going to let me. So instead, I turned to modeling. My early models were very, very slick, basically a Sprite bottle in a, in a flume, a recirculating flume. And I added some plankton particles, and I ran a whole bunch of trials. So this is for whale shark here. We also did this with one that was similar to a manta ray. And we ran all these trials, changing the angle of the gills and the permeability of the gills. And what I found is speed was the most important thing for changing the size selectivity, just like I saw out in the field. So if I wanted to select for very small particles, I sped up the models. If I wanted to get very large particles, I slowed way down. So great, easy, it's just speed that's changing. It still doesn't answer exactly how they're catching these tiny particles, but I know that it has something to do with the speed. So I wasn't satisfied with the easy peasy models, but you always start simple and then you scale up. So then I had all of these um, animals in museums. I started taking CT scans, so CAT scans just like you would have if you went to um, the doctor. And we started to create these very um, anatomically correct models. So here they are. This is at the one time size scale, so exactly the size of the of the actual filter itself. And these are at four times the size, because at four times the size, we can actually slow down the, um, the fluid so that we can visualize what we're seeing. So it's kind of nice. And so we're modeling the different morphologies of the filter. So this one happens to be manta ray. Some of them have these little tooth-like structures on them. Some of them are completely smooth. And some of them have these little finger-like projections in the pore that actually occludes the pore a little bit. OK, so this is what we found. This is in a flow tank. The blue is just colored fluid to let us see. And we saw this really neat thing that's never been seen biologically in any other animal. We have this cross flow up above, which I mentioned we had cross flow filtration before. Great. What we weren't expecting are these little eddies down below. And so to me, I thought, oh, we have a Dyson vacuum cleaner, right? It has that cyclone. The cyclone gets smaller as it goes towards you in the audience. And so we get smaller and smaller particles the faster or slower we go. I've solved the problem. I'm a genius, right? What do we not do when we solve a problem? We don't test it, right? We leave it at that. Because that's not what's happening. So there's our Dyson vacuum. I then put some particles in there to make sure that I was correct, right? Don't ever do that. <laughs> so what you'll notice here, we're going to follow this particle that's going to come in. And you're going to notice it's going to bounce, 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 bounce. And it never hits that eddy. So it's not a cyclone. It's not a Dyson vacuum cleaner. And I sat on this for a good couple of months going, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening. Something's happening. The particles aren't exiting. There's no clogging. But I don't know what the mechanism is there. It's really fun to watch, though. So thankfully, we came up with something that made sense. As water and food particles moved in, the water would start to deviate out the pores. That was expected. Particles then would pass those eddies. And actually, they seemed to speed up when they got past that eddy. Like that eddy was actually accelerating the particle. And so that particle would then accelerate and then fling off of this next filter, kind of like a pinball machine. So you guys, I can actually use that. If I tell my 20-year-olds in my class as a pinball machine, they have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> So it's basically like a pinball machine, and it ricochets back up. And that's never been seen before in any organism. So we wanted to test it and make sure that that's really what was happening from the physics perspective. We had models that showed that they were doing this. And so I paired up with my very good friend, James Strother, who's a professor, used to be at Oregon State. Now he's at Whitney Marine Labs. And he runs computational fluid dynamics, which is um, a mathematics-based program that allows us to look at flow um, computationally. 
And so what you'll see here is the blue is the water as it moves across the pore and exits, and the red is the particle. And, he, and based on the morphology of the animal itself, which we gave him and he modeled, you notice he got exactly the same results. The particles are bouncing across the filter, and they're not exiting, except for this one particle that got into the eddy, and it never, ever came back out. So we definitely, just by that particle, showed that it's not using that cyclonic filtration, because once it gets in, into the cyclone, it can't leave. What's really neat about this is we were able to test the different sizes, and we found that, um, so here we have a pore size of about 1,100 microns, and we're at 100% efficiency at somewhere around 400 microns. So it's definitely not a sieve filter, right? It's a ricochet filter, and it can filter much smaller particles than the size of the pore itself. The pore size really doesn't, doesn't mean anything. What happens is this cyclone actually helps to occlude the pore, which actually makes it a better filter for smaller particles. Now, there are no filters that filter well with small particles on the market today. These guys are really special. And we can actually run these models now, or we have run these models, I should say, and we've gotten down to much, much smaller particles. The orientation of the filter is actually the critically important thing. So these filters are about at a 40 degree angle to the flow. If we adjust the angle a little bit, this one's a little bit different, a little adjusted, you'll notice you get clogging effects. So we have a non-clogging filter if we run it in the anatomical position. And if we don't, if we slightly adjust this filter, we get that clogging effect. So I've always wanted to have a promotional video, and I've got one now. So I had to show you. This is my little promotional video. I'm telling you the size scale of the Manta. That's what the filter looks like itself. They're really beautiful, kind of fractile looking patterns. And there's that, that filtration going. So here's the water moving down, and there's a particle bounce, bounce, bounce. So this was completely new to science. There's no filter on the market that works like it. There's no filter known in um, biology that's like it. So we actually had to name this filter. And I really wanted to name it the Misty filter because everybody else names things after themselves. And then I rethought it because ricochet is such a cool name. <laughs> we chose a ricochet filter. It ricochets, the particles ricochet off of that filter. And Oregon State, we, we at Fullerton weren't able to make a, a video, so that's why it says Oregon State on there, because they were able to make it better for us. All right, so we actually, just in January, we patented this design. And right now we're testing optimized versions of this in order to potentially use it for wastewater treatment to filter out microplastics, which are a real problem. There are no other high efficiency filters on the market that don't clog. It's not a thing, but our filter does. So at this moment, and we're still under the R&D of this, we, um, we have a filter that basically is running at a very uh, high efficiency and low energy, because all other filters require a backwash system to come out and clear it once it clogs, and this doesn't need that. So this is uh, an early prototype of what our filter looks like. This one over here, I have an undergrad working on now. We're doing the exact same thing with a whale shark filter now, because whale sharks also don't have clogging. So that's our early version of a whale shark filter. And we're finding that whale shark filters also are selecting for smaller particles. So that's our next step. OK, so I gave you story number one. But I promised that you'd get a couple different fish stories here. So our next fish story, I'll admit, is a little bit graphic, so I'll warn you when I get to the graphic part. Um, so exploration of fishes. When my second Andrew came into the lab, this is him here, we were very interested in fish armor. So I had started down a path working with some undergraduates over a summer project looking at fishes with um, lots of armor that were teeny tiny in the marine environment. 
And I started to wonder, why would a little fish have such robust armor when really any fish could just come in and swallow it and not need the armor itself? And so we started working on uh, marine fishes. And when he came to the lab, I said, you know, this really baffles me. I need somebody on this project. And he said, sure, I love armor. And so we started looking not at the little marine fishes, but a fish that lives in the Amazon. So this is a little Cory catfish right here. This is Corydoras trilineatus. There's lots of Corydoras. There's some of the, I would say, cutest fish you could keep at a home aquarium. So they're teeny tiny, about yay big, and they like to school together, and they are really kind of full of personality and cute, and um, it, they come in all different shapes and colors and sizes, and they're adorable. Uh, when we first started, we started thinking, okay, why would this little fish have such strong armor? Who's going to be eating it? And the best we could come up with was, well, piranhas live in the same spot. So in red, you see where piranhas are found. In this brown color here is where all of the Corydoras are found. And then these blue spots is where Corydoras trilineatus, this one here, is found. And so they do overlap with piranha territory. But we didn't think it was going to be adult piranhas because they're pretty big. And so that wouldn't even be a, a swallow for an adult piranha. But juvenile piranhas and small piranhas might actually eat these things. So we started searching the literature, and sure enough, there were a couple aquarium hobbyists that said, oh, my piranhas love to eat these little quarry catfishes. And we said, great, we need piranhas. Really, it was an excuse for us to bring piranhas in because they're illegal in California, and we got to put a, a special uh, <laughs> permit in. So we have piranhas in the lab, and we get really excited about it. We like our corridors, too. All right, so armor and fishes is really not new actually. So um, this is an arowana. This is also a fish that lives in the Amazon. And actually this month there was a big paper that came out that was like, a piranha can't eat this arowana fish. This arowana is taller than me. It's about six feet long. Um, and it has these really tough scales. So yeah, okay, I kind of was like, well, that makes sense. Of course, it can't get through these, these scales. But the paper itself was showing that um, it was the mechanical properties of this armor, the how tough it was, plus this nice soft layer underneath that actually allowed it to withstand piranha bites. Because you can imagine, one piranha sure might not be able to get through it, but a whole pack of piranhas going after something may or may not stand up to it. This fish is heavily armored, it's like a tank, and piranhas cannot get through that. We've been basing our armors, bio-inspired armors, on fish armors, like the arowana, for obviously a very long time, since at least the Han Dynasty at 206 BC. So that's an example of um, a fish scale armor from that period. And of course, this uh, periodically gets revived. So you probably went and saw Aquaman, right, with his beautiful fish armor on there. I actually think that they did a really good job with that armor. It's probably pretty impenetrable, um, except for it's probably plastic, because if that was metal, right? Can you imagine trying to, to move around in that thing? Yeah, it wouldn't happen. So there's our little Cory catfish. And it's very hard to see just because of the coloration, but actually this whole part of the fish right here is all armor. If we were to take off that armor and clearance stain it, this is a, a visualization technique that we actually digest away um, some of the skin on it, and then we stain anything with mineral. So like bone would stain kind of a reddish color. Anything that's cartilaginous would stain a blue color. And this one kind of stains a purple. So we can see that all of these sort of lines down here are heavily mineralized, and it's very overlapping. So we call that imbrication, but that's sort of important to notice that it has these overlapping scales. So we went ahead and we tested this in the lab. We basically punctured it. We did it uh, punctures with both a needle, and this is not on live fish, um, and also with piranha teeth. So we pulled piranha teeth and we punctured it as well just to see how it would hold up against a tooth or a needle. And what we found is they're pretty robust little fish. So for a teeny tiny fish, it was withstanding this one about up to five newtons, this one up to 10 newtons with a piranha tooth. So remember one newton is basically an apple dro dropping on your head, right? So this is like 10 apples dropping on your head on this thing and it's withstanding it pretty much no problem. But that doesn't really tell us if it would withstand a piranha bite because when we looked, there were really no 
measurements of piranhas other than this black piranha, which is the fiercest piranha in the, in the Amazon, but not other piranhas which overlap in the same area. So for us, red belly piranhas were a good example of a piranha that would be in the same area that's pretty, pretty bitey. So we have our piranhas and we started to do some bite force tests on them. So there he is biting. I just love this video. Um, he's at about 10 newtons. So at the very top range of these little Corydoras, and we thought, oh, these things are doomed. They're not going to withstand piranha bites. That's not what they're armored for. So the next video is a little bit graphic. So if you are squeamish, you might turn away for this one. We tested it, the Corydora against the piranha. So there's the Cory catfish, here's the piranha. And you'll notice that that piranha comes in to take a bite of that Corydora. Bite, 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 bite. 10 bites, that no puncture in that Corydora. We weren't expecting that. We thought it was gonna be one bite and done. So it withstood the test of the piranha, even though when we were testing it, on its own, just the scale itself, it punctured. So what's happening there? I love that the corridor is not even faced by that, like, you're not getting in here. Right. And then we took him out and gave him some food. All right. So what's happening here? Corridor armor is actually very similar to tile. Have you all laid tile before? I have to do it at my house. My husband hates it. He doesn't have the patience for it. Right? So tile is a very brittle substance. It holds up, it's hard, but if you have something pressed down on it, let's say it's your daughter's high heels, right? Because that's how I ruined mine. It's a whole bunch of pounds per square inch in a small area and you'll get a crack. The beautiful part about the, at least this size tile, about 12 by 12, is that you put grout around it. And the grout is a completely different substance. So usually, once that crack, even though it's propagating across this tile, once it hits a new substance, it stops the crack propagation, right? The same thing is happening with the corridors where they have a really tough armor. But underneath the armor, they have um, collagen fibers. So the same stuff that makes us nice and taut with our skin is underneath. So here's the collagen layer, and when we puncture it with a needle, we actually have a little bit of bending that happens with the scale, so it, pr it reduces the amount of puncture that happens. But if we puncture hard enough, then it hits this really soft underlying tissue and it stops that crack, pa crack propagation so it doesn't go across um, multiple scoots. There are two spots that the armor fails. One right behind the operculum, which is where the fish breathes. So it's armored from behind the operculum back. And we found that if the piranha was able to move about until it could get to the operculum, it would bite through and immediately the fish was decapitated. So it does fail. Also at the base of the fin. So here's where the armor ends and then it has this little bit of skin that's exposed and piranhas know that. So they usually go for the tail and try to bite off the tail so the corridor can't actually swim away. So what is that good for? Well, corridoras tend to live in um, on the bottom and they do, uh, they're called obligate um, air breathers. So they have to go up to the top to breathe unlike most fishes. So they can breathe with their gills but they have to take gulps every so often. And so when they shoot up is when they're exposed to piranhas. So if a piranha comes in and it's madly trying to get this Corydora, it usually will bite in the biggest part of the body as it's just trying to grab the fish. And these little scales can withstand that piranha bite. So as long as the piranha has to open its mouth and reposition, this little thing can get away and escape into um, the little lush sort of um, almost like bushes but not underwater. They're, they are plants, um, so that's where it kind of lives. And so it lives to, to fight another day. Um, occasionally they'll get punctured, but that one puncture usually damages only a single scale. So they're not 
compromise from other bites, and they can actually regenerate those scales over time. For me, it's exciting because now I'm thinking, what do I do with this puncture-resistant thing? Um, so most people kind of go the, the war route and think about armor for um, soldiers. For me, because this is so small and so flexible, I think about gardening gloves, right? Because I like to go in and, and think about uh, my rose bushes and how even my gardening gloves, when I'm trying to manipulate my hands, I either have gardening gloves that are too thick that I can't really get a good handle on things, or they're too thin and I'm feeling the punctures as I manipulate my hands. So our application that we are sort of exploring right now are bigger, better um, gardening gloves that are thin enough for you to manipulate your hands, but um, flexible enough and hard enough to withstand those punctures. Okay, so that's two. Bigger butter filters and puncture resistant gloves potentially from the sea. This one was kind of a neat one because it's so far away from my initial interests. My Andrew 1.0 came in um, to the lab and he said, I really like fish bone. And I said, great, there's almost nothing known about fish bone. So, um, we had a little bit of a problem because his initial project, what he wanted to do is he wanted to look at tuna's fish bone. And unfortunately, with mechanical testing, which is what we've been doing here with the punctures and, and things, usually has to happen on fresh tissue. You can't really do it on, on uh, frozen tissue because presumably the mechanical properties change in freezing. So just to give you an idea why that is, not all bone is the same. So bone is um, this beautiful sort of composition of mineralization, organic material, and water. And the different amounts of these three things will change how bone reacts. So for example, you might have uh, antler bone in there, which is essentially uh, sort of a low mineral and acts like a spring. So every time the deer will hit each other, it takes all of that force and sort of springs out so that it doesn't damage the rest of the skull of the um, antlers. You have deep sea fish bone, which is very low mineralization and very high water content, which allows the fish to survive those crushing pressures of the deep. Um, if you bring these up to the surface, which we have lots of them in the lab right now, they're basically like jelly. So you can bend them all around and um, yeah, they're, they're not strong bone whatsoever. But it's good because it's the same density as the water. Or you can have really, really highly mineralized bone like your ear bones, which essentially act like a tuning fork. And so they um, will accentuate the sounds that you hear by vibrating and then um, transitioning that vibration from sound into your cochlea here to um, here. Most bone has living bone cell in it. These are called osteocytes. And so here those osteocytes are here. It has cells that will build the bone itself, or pardon me, right here, osteoblast. Blast means build. And it also has these cells that break down bone called osteoclasts, which digest away bone. And that's how your bone remodels. So if you get a break, you'll have osteoclasts come in, take away the damaged material, the osteoblasts will come back and build up that material, and then it leaves these living cells, osteocytes, which are going to sense mechanical damage and um, um, bring in nutrients and allow your bone to be a living tissue. But fish bone, for the most part, with a few exceptions, is very different than bone that we normally study. So here is a fish that is more similar to you. This is um, a carp bone, and what you see is all of these little holes in here are called lacunae, and inside of those holes you have those osteocytes, which are the bone-sensing cells. Fishes make up about 60% of the vertebrates on Earth, and the majority of these fishes actually don't have those living bone cells. So here is an example of a tilapia bone, and you notice that there are no little lacunae in there that have those living cells. So this is called anosteocytic or acellular bone. It's not truly acellular because it does have some of these things that build it up and break it down. And 
considering that's 60% of our vertebrates on this planet, you would think that this is a well-studied system. But we ignore fishes for the most part. And so there's all of, at this point, eight papers that even mention this stuff. Only one mechanically tests it. So we had, we had a problem here. So Andrew was interested in looking at the tunas because in the tunas, there are some that have the bone cells in them and there are some that are anosteocytic, but no bone cells. And so this was a really nice a group of fishes to start testing the mechanical differences and how this bone reacts in different ways if you have cells or not. The problem is we couldn't get fresh big tuna. We kept finding that we could only get frozen tuna. And so we didn't know if it would be performing properly if the tissue was frozen. So we kind of switched this project because we said we can't really do this project if we have frozen tissue, but you know, we can test it and see if freezing the tissue actually makes a difference to see if we can maybe carry out this project a little bit later. So we chose a chub mackerel because this is easily accessible off our coast. And um, when we looked at the bone inside of the chub mackerel, this was one of the anosteocytic, no bone in, or no bone cells in the fish. So we tested that against a couple of the fish. So some of the fish that had the bone cells have been tested before. And we found that under mechanical testing, the fish with no bone cells basically was super weak compared to fish with bone cells. So here are a couple of the fishes with the bone cells. Down here, this is um, the Young's modulus. So this is a metric for how bendy it is before it breaks. Here is your mammal bone cell here. So we're at about 18,000 there for mammals, about 9,000, so half of the strength in most fishes with bone. And then you'll notice that we have cartilage and our fish down here that it doesn't even show up on there because it's somewhere around 200. So what we noticed on that was, oh, that's weird. That fish bone is actually acting kind of like cartilage. Okay, so cartilage really doesn't freeze well. Uh, let me show you, that's what, our, that's what our freezer currently looks like actually. It's a little embarrassing. So we thought, okay, cartilage doesn't freeze well, I wonder if this bone will actually hold up to freezing because we can't do this test on, on our tunas if it denatures. So the reason cartilage doesn't freeze well is it undergoes thermomechanical stress. It's a really fancy word for talking about ice cubes essentially. When you put ice cubes into a glass and you pour a warm drink, let's say it's a soda, over it, what happens to the ice cube? Cracks, right? Yeah, exactly. That's because the substance is warmer than the inside core of that ice cube. And so there's that thermomechanical difference that cracks it. And that's exactly what happens with cartilage when you freeze it. It undergoes this fracture stress. So we expected that we would get this fracture stress with this bone. We weren't going to be able to test all this bone. We had to get fresh samples. We were going to have to scrap this project. And we found something very different. So here's fresh tissue. This one that you can't very well see, and I have to change that color, is 25 days frozen. Here's 45 days frozen. And here is store-bought fish, which I really don't want to tell you about because you don't know how many times your store-bought fish has been frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed and frozen and thawed, which is why we chose it. And we tested that and we did the mechanical tests across the board and what we actually found was there was no difference in how this bone was performing, whether it was fresh or frozen or fresh, frozen, fresh, frozen, fresh, frozen, you don't know how many times. Which was kind of interesting because we thought that there was going to be this big drop in mechanical performance on these frozen fish. We said, oh, we might be actually be able to test this stuff. So we wanted to be certain. And we um, tested the collagen inside because we weren't really worried about the mineralization inside of the thing because mineral, basically you can, you can take a skeleton, right, and you can dry it out and you're still going to have the mineral there, but you lose all of that, that fresh sort of organic stuff is what happens. And so we looked at the organics and we actually found that there was really no difference in freezing. The organics stayed really well. 
And so then we wanted to just, just be certain. And so we took the same fish bone and we tested it fresh and we tested that same bone frozen and there was no difference. And then we took it out of the fridge and we thawed it and we left it for a while, not enough to actually make it uh, rot, but for a, a couple hours, then we refroze it again and we tested it again and there was no difference, which was kind of awesome actually um, because, oh, before I say because, so we also did test the, um, the water, the mineral, and the um, organics in here just to make sure that it was no difference across the board, and it wasn't. So what that allowed us to do is go, wow, we have this opportunity to basically test any fish on the planet, even if it was frozen, even if it was frozen and thawed. If we found something interesting in a market, we could pick it up and it would perform exactly the same, which opens up all of this opportunity to potentially test this fishbone. Our fishbone, the anosteocytic fishbone here, mechanically was very interesting. So the performance when um, you compare it to bone is basically like hyaline cartilage, which is most of the cartilage in your body. It's very flexible, but it freezes like osteocytic bone. So you can freeze uh, cow bone for indefinite periods of time and take it back out and it me performs mechanically beautifully. So we're able to now go and take any fish, it doesn't matter if it's from the Philippines or from the middle of the ocean at depth, and we can now test these bones, which is super awesome for us. But there are bigger implications for um, the planet. For us, we noticed that if it's performing like cartilage, there's a potential for this to be an excellent grafting agent. So um, when you go through bone grafts, you can do it in a couple different ways. You can take bone from yourself, which requires two surgeries. It's very painful for the person who is going through that bone graft, but at least your body recognizes it as your own material, and so you don't have to, to go on immunosuppressants if you have a bone from yourself. You can, alternatively get a bone graft from someone else, a donor, but then you're gonna be on immunosuppressants for the rest of your life because you have foreign uh, material in your body. Or if you can't find a donor person, you might get a bone graft from another animal, a xenograft. So this tends to be from pigs is where we, we pull xenografts from, but it can be from multiple different types of animal. And so here you can see a bone graft inside of a bone. And so you are essentially putting foreign material in and your body will then break down using those osteoclasts, that bone that was put in, and then rebuild it and you're good with your bone. So that takes, oh, roughly about six months to happen. Um, but you're always gonna have that little bit of foreign DNA in there, which is why you have to have that, that um, immunosuppressants. For us, we have fish bone that doesn't have living cells in it, which means we don't have the foreign DNA problem. And it mechanically acts like cartilage, which is what your body does. It breaks down the bone and makes it back into cartilage and then builds it back up. So we're taking away a step of potentially uh, recovery, right? And we're saying, here's this cartilage stuff, build it back up into bone. So it should reduce the time for recovery from bone grafting. So we're currently working on that right now, and we've paired with some researchers at UCLA um, to test that. So the last little bit that I'll talk to you about today is just a one slide talk about what we're doing at the moment with, um, actually I had mentioned James Strother over at Whitney um, Marine Labs earlier as my computational fluid dynamicist. This is his brilliant wife, Sandra. And so she's a biochemist, uh, she used to be at Oregon State, and now she's also at Whitley Marine Lab, they moved together. And so Sandra came out um, to Fullerton uh, a couple years back, and she gave a, just a brilliant talk on antibiotics. And she's interested in finding new antibiotics, new sources for antibiotics, and new types of antibiotics. And she was mostly interested in looking at seaweeds. So when she was a grad student, she had, um, had luck and discovered a new antibiotic, which is no small feat because it takes years and years and years to process one sample. Um, and so this is what her talk was about. And I sat in her talk and I was just kind of wowed by her. This was actually the first time I had met her, even though I had known him since grad school. 
And I said, Sandra, have you ever thought about fish? And she kind of thought, like, no, because I don't go in the ocean. I just go out and scrub things and, and do my thing. And I said, well, you know, fish have a really interesting covering on them. They're sort of mucus coated. And so on that mucus, I would expect that there's lots of, of uh, microbiome um, on each fish would be different. Uh, but it's not really been explored. And she said, well, I'd be happy to do that if you can get me the fish because I'm not going on a boat because she gets seasick. I get seasick every time I go on a boat, but it doesn't stop me. So we paired up. Um, and uh, I started pulling fish. So I started um, out getting fish in the LA Harbor. Has everybody seen the LA Harbor before? <sighs> right? So the LA Harbor is basically brown, right? Because it's one of the busiest harbors in the entire nation, not, um, you know, maybe in the world, but definitely in, in the US. And so it's a big shipping environment, and there's lots of oil and other things in there. And I thought, you know, if we're going to find a new antibiotic, it's going to be a fish that's living in that crud. <laughs> and so we went out sampling, and um, I sent her off those fish. And then I said, you know, there's other places that if we're going to do this, we may as just well sample across the board. So then we went out a couple more times, and I pulled some fish from the deep sea, so um, from the mesopelagic, which is about 1,000 meters deep. So some of those you know, really deep sea fish that I showed you earlier, that was what that project was from. And I started swabbing these samples and sending them off to her. And I hadn't heard anything for a couple of years because apparently this takes a really long time. And I am not a lab jockey, so I just let her do her thing. And I got a call about uh, nine months ago, and she said, Misty, you know those fish that you sent me? I said, yes. She said, we got something here. Oh, OK. So at least in her first fish that she tested, the very first one was a pink surf perch. Pink surf perch is really hard to get to. It's only found in this one spot at about 90 meters deep. It's a secret spot. Nobody will tell you where it is. I happen to know where it was because I brought fishermen some fish. So they gave me the location, and I got this fish. And we swabbed it. And I didn't think that this fish would get a hit at all. And she said, this pink surf perch actually has a metabolite in here that is resistant to human carcinoma in the colons. It's resisting growth of cancer. So she has cancer cells there. She puts this metabolite in there, and it's gone. And I said, that's phenomenal. She said, yes. So she got lots of press over this in the past year because her student Paige, this is her grad student Paige, this is her undergrad Molly. Um, so this is primarily Paige's project. Um, she presented this at the American Chemical Society to big wows. I got a call from Sandra about three weeks ago and she said, Misty, you know that other fish you sent me and I'm not allowed to tell you what fish it is just yet. <laughs> She says, I think we've got it. I think we've got a new antibiotic. And I said, no, you're crazy. And she said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish up this and make sure that we really have it. But if so, then we've got to patent something new. And I said, crap, patenting is a long process, but OK. So I'm not allowed to tell you what fish it is, but I am allowed to, because I have a big mouth, say she's got something. So um, my point of this is that if we are wanting to find new inspiration, whether it be for filtration devices, for human health, for antibiotics, we need to start looking to the sea. And we need to start taking care of our sea. That's my little plug for that. Because I do have my, my postdoc back here who's working on microplastics and finding that um, they are just laden with pollution where we're finding all of these really awesome discoveries. So with that, thank you for putting up with me. And I am happy to take any questions you might have today. <laughs> yeah. You've talked about getting patents on some of these innovations. Yeah. Uh, do you have a strategy for uh, products eventually coming from those patents? Yeah. So. Uh, Yes. <laughs> uh, for the antibiotics, I don't have to make the product because I get sort of uh, handled on their end. For my filtration stuff, actually, is a bigger issue, and that's why I sort of 
made the sigh um, because I am not by any means a businesswoman. Um, but luckily, I have a very intelligent husband who happens to have a degree in business and is very keen on this. So he's, yeah, I'm doing all the R&D of um, optimizing this thing. And he has basically, basically been in talks with um, different companies about licensing out um, what we've found. And so I also have now partnered with a wastewater treatment plants to test this in their facilities to make sure. So the idea is um, if it's for the good of the world, we license it for basically nothing. If it's for something like um, a Brita water filter, then they can pay a fee for it to fund the next step of the research. And so that's where we're at with that right now. Thank you for having me. Thank you again. <laughs>